Good morning. As the video reminded us, the uh, shape the world is in is not much different these days than it was when Jesus came. The Messiah came into the world, and we are so grateful. The first four Sundays leading up to Christmas are traditionally called the Sundays of hope, of joy, of peace, and of love. And we celebrate, as we begin the Christmas season here at Park Plaza, the joy, the hope, the love, the peace that Christ brought to earth. Let's begin our service this morning by standing and singing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. So glad that you're here today. Welcome to Park Plaza. By way of prayer items, we have several to bring to your attention. Cross Lines and Souls Harbor, our prayer focus of the month. And then finally, the people and country of Israel and Ukraine. Uh, just a tough situation over uh, in that part of the world to lift them up in prayer. Would you bow as we open this morning? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for a day to be here. Father, to come into the season where we celebrate the birth of a Savior. Lord, we are grateful for Cross Lines and for Souls Harbor and how they meet the needs of those in our community who are without a place to stay or without food. We pray for their effectiveness and for your blessings on their ministry. Father, we do lift up the volatility in our world today, specifically the situations over in Israel and Gaza as well as Ukraine. Father, we pray for the many Christians who are affected by uh, these issues as well as, uh, Father, just your people, that you would be peace to that region of the world and be with those who are making decisions. Father, be with our service this morning. May all we do be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Could you write the story of the Bible in one sentence? Perhaps this. The triune God rescues fallen creation and moves it to new creation. The preparation for that rescue took thousands of years. But the specific beginning of that rescue took place when we heard a baby's cry in a Bethlehem manger. Has that baby rescued you? Christmas greetings and New Year's best wishes from the Park Plaza Christian Church in Joplin. Each year at Christmas time, we do put out a commercial um, showing the uh, uh, minister and talking about the Christmas season and inviting those to come to Park Plaza. So this was our commercial for this year and you may have seen it on one of the TV stations already. John begins his gospel differently than the other gospels in that he doesn't tell the nativity story uh, or the wise men story. Uh, John begins by talking about Jesus being from the beginning of all time and Jesus was with God and Jesus was one who created the world. And he refers to Jesus as the Word, and the Word became flesh. I want to read that scripture from John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Our songs this morning, our Christmas songs, as we begin this season of the celebration of the birth of Christ, and they're songs that also all talk about the glory, the glory we have seen in Jesus, the glory the angels declared, the glory that Jesus was as he came to earth. Let's begin our singing time here with angels from the realms of glory. i 
one story now proclaim Messiah's birth.
we strive to give him the glory in everything we do. And anytime we have a service, uh, a musical performance of any kind, we pray that what we do is giving God the glory. Later this week, this weekend, uh, Park Plaza presents um, for you at the church and for the community our program we call Christmas at the Plaza. And uh, we have some uh, guests who always help us out at the program as well as our own members. This morning, a couple of those guests who are going to be helping us in the program this next weekend are with us and going to share with us some special music time. Gavin Phillips is with us from Web City and Noah Harris is with us from Lamar. And Noah has several family members represented with him today and we welcome you, you're glad you're here with us. And they'll be sharing um, a song that will come from the plaza, kind of give you a prelude from our program coming up this next weekend. At this time in the service, we always set aside to commemorate what the Lord has done for us, to worship him, to give him glory through the emblems of the Lord's Supper. We'll be singing a hymn that reminds us of Jesus coming to earth. His purpose when he came to earth was for his death, for his sacrifice, for his victory over the grave. And this song mentions all those aspects of his coming to earth. And then we'll have a time of meditation and prayer. And then I'll return and lead us all in taking of the Lord's Supper in unison this morning. I'm sure most of you know what I'm referring to when I say the look. I'm referring to the look from your mom or dad or maybe your wife when you're doing something ornery. When I was in high school, several of us boys, the Hardys, the Pals, and the Daniels, we were sitting in the overflow section of the church in the back and Laura um, Lee Davin was sitting, we had sort of curved chairs, pews, and she's sitting here, half of her where she can face the front, and the other half where she could turn and see what us guys were doing. So one wintry night, when we had our coats and hats on, us guys decided that we would take our glove and put it on our right foot and cross our legs, and every time Laura Lee looked back at us, we would just start <laughs> waving. <laughs> I, 
I'm not for sure, according to the look that she gave us, if it was a look of disgust or if she was about to laugh out loud. However, the look on the face was nothing compared to the look on my dad's face, who was sitting on the stage observing everything we were doing. (laughs) The look on his face was one of, stop it. (laughs) Knowing the lecture my brother and I would receive when we got home and possibly some other disciplinary actions, We waited until my dad got up to preach, and then we all sort of raised our right leg and began to wave (laughs) at my dad. We had not heard about Dennis Haley's The Law of Holes yet. Perhaps it was the look Jesus gave to Peter when he was warming, uh, warming his hands by the charcoal fire And after being asked if he was one of Jesus' disciples, he vehemently began cursing and denying that he knew Jesus and the rooster crowed. Perhaps it was a look Jesus gave to the crowd as he was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Dottie Rambo put it this way in her song, He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. Perhaps it was a look Jesus gave Peter after he had been raised from the dead and was cooking some fish, again, on a charcoal fire, only the second time used in the scripture, and asked Peter, Do you love me? Perhaps it was a look Paul wrote about when he told us to examine ourselves before we partake of these emblems. Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord passed before him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, But I who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Jesus said he would not partake of these emblems until we all partake together in heaven. Rusty Goodman put it this way, when you finally make your entrance to that city, of jasper walls and bright golden avenues, as you behold all its beauty and its splendor, remember there's just one request I make of you. Look for me, for I will be there too. Let's pray. Lord, help us to look at ourselves as we partake of these emblems in a worthy manner. And we long for the day when we can partake of it with you again, together in heaven. Amen. Reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all partake of the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's share in the cup.
Therefore, whenever you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church bells ring, people celebrating the birth of the King. Shout and hugs and until the heavens ring. Christmas is coming, let the church bells ring. Christmas is coming, Mary's baby boy. Bringing us a message of comfort and joy. Glory, hallelujah, what a wonderful thing. Christmas is coming, let the church bells ring. for today's message that you have given Mark to share with us. We pray that our hearts and our minds will listen closely to what you have to tell us. We pray that we can we pray that we can draw closer, ever closer to you by letting Jesus reign in our lives every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Roger, for your prayer and for your tender heart. And what about that quartet today? Wasn't that a joyous thing? That was really, really marvelous. 
And just uh, previews of coming attractions for us for this very, very busy week. Uh, wow, welcome to Christmas season at Park Plaza. We are glad that you are here to share in what is typically called the first Sunday, the celebration of Christmas, the first Sunday of Advent. And uh, we are glad that you're sharing with us. You can see that the building has kind of come to life since last Lord's Day. And we appreciate uh, Sister Anna, Sister Judy, and a bunch of other people that helped to get us in this festive uh, season here at the church building. Maybe Maybe your upbringing was kind of like mine, and that is that you learned some things in your younger years of faith about Scripture. And one of the things that you learned early on was that there are two Testaments. There is an Old Testament and there is a New Testament. And then later on we learned that the language, primary language, that the Old Testament is written in is Hebrew. And the language that the New Testament is written in is Greek. And you learn that these testaments are not exactly the same, that they are different. I was taught things like the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is gospel. That's not wrong. It's just a little inadequate, I suppose. Once in a while, you'd hear somebody say something like this. Well, uh, I like the God of the New Testament better than the God of the Old. Because the God of the Old seems so wrathful and the God of the New seems so loving. Okay, I understand where they're coming from, but again, you kind of find that that idea that the Testaments are in great discontinuity is not maybe wrong, but just inadequate and very uh, woefully uh, inept. Then we, as we would grow, we would learn that no, really, this Bible is quite in a state of continuity. The Testaments actually do relate to one another. And in fact, that comes to us kind of in layers, if you will. And it's all one redemptive story that the scholars call salvation history. And that's what we find as we look at these Testaments. Here we are kind of toward the end of our 2023 year. And we will remember that we took as our theme this year, based on the prime number 23, can't be divided by anything but one or 23, undivided. So we've been talking about unity all year long. And in this final series of messages, in the Christmas series, I want to deal with undivided in the Testaments. Undivided in the Testaments. Because really old and new, in the prediction of the coming of the Messiah, really have just one message for us. So we'll be looking at the predictive prophecies in the old and the fulfillment in the new and try to tie those things together. I am calling this undivided in the polity of the child king. Undivided in the polity of the child king. We probably ought to define our terms as we start. What in the world does polity mean? Well, it just means a process of governance. How things are governed. All right. David already made mention of some football stuff in his announcements today. So let's just go there. When it comes to playing sports, there are rule books. That's polity, governance, how the game should be done. I think I've mentioned to you before that way back in the day when the great coach Vince Lombardi was up in Green Bay, he had an org chart in his office behind the big mahogany desk in front. And the org chart went like this. It said in a box up at the top, Vince Lombardi, general manager and coach. Then there was an arrow pointing down and another box that said, everybody else. Pretty hard to miss that one. That's how that polity worked. Somebody's in charge. We also have this in music. Appreciate the guys being here today, giving us a little bit of the, a taste of uh, Christmas at the Plaza. But uh, there are rules to good music. I don't know anything about them, but there's this thing called theory. Okay, I think it has to do with math in music. That's all I can understand. But anyway, there are rules to good music. And there are rules to how a government should function. In our particular case, we have three branches, don't we? We have the legislative branch, we have the executive branch, and we have the judicial branch. And they work together to function, that's what we call polity, in the church. It's no different. We have elders, and we have deacons, and we have ministry staff, and we have membership. And somehow we're all supposed to get along and do this thing called church together. There's a certain way it works. It's a polity. It's a process of governance. Well, what kind of governance, what kind of polity does heaven have? What kind of polity will the child king, the Messiah, bring to this earth? I think we can see it 
in a couple of passages that will be woven together today. And kind of to put it all in one sentence, it would come out sort of like this. The polity of the child king rests in his character. The polity of the child king rests in his character. And we'll see it from a passage in Isaiah, and we'll see it from a passage in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your scriptures, turn with me or devices to Luke. Excuse me, we'll look at that in a second. We'll look at, first of all, Isaiah, and we'll be in particular chapter 9. When you come to this Gospel prophet written previous to the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity some 700 years before Jesus, you find that God's people were compromised. They weren't living the way they were supposed to live. In fact, in the first chapter, Isaiah the prophet has to say, God's kind of had it up to here with you folks. And you need to come. Let us reason together, saith the Lord of hosts, that though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's the invitation, chapter 1. You read on in, you get to chapter uh, 3, 4, finally get to 5, and he says, Oh, Israel, what's wrong with you? I planted you as a vineyard, and I came to look for grapes, and all I found were wild grapes. That's not what he's supposed to have. So somehow God is going to reestablish his reign, reestablish his polity, as it were. And so we come to chapter 7. And chapter 7 says that a virgin will conceive and give birth to somebody who will bring in the polity. And you might be tempted to think by the time you get to chapter 8, oh, it must be the prophet's son. Because Isaiah would go into the prophetess and she would conceive and give birth to a son. Maybe this is the one. And his name would be, ready for this, Mayor Shella Hashbaz. You can't even get that on the softball jersey of the church. Okay, Mayor Shella Hashbaz. But all of a sudden you realize, no, no, that's not the child king. It's not Isaiah's kid that's going to bring in this new polity. It's somebody that would come later. And we get to Isaiah chapter 9 and we find out who that's going to be. And it starts out by saying that there'll come a time when there's no more gloom. I love to listen to the Fountain View Academy up in British Columbia, that specialized music school of high school kids, only about 60 of them or so that go to this school. We mentioned it before to you, but they sing a song that you probably heard. No more. I can't sing today. Sorry. I apologize. Hope the raspy voice doesn't get in the way. No more night. No more gloom. That's how it starts. And you saw it on the screen earlier that there was a light that shone in the darkness. And way up north where Zebulun and Naphtali, those tribes were. Because they would get the brunt of the battles from Assyria and Babylon first. No more gloom. No more night. Because God's going to bring the child king. And when he brings the child king, the polity is going to be different. Look at it with me in verse 6, if you will, of Isaiah chapter 9. Here's what it says. For to us a child is born. Now in Hebrew and Greek, if you want to underline a word, you stick it first in the sentence. Guess which word is first in this sentence? Child. Child. The accent's on the child. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, the Hebrew word is misra. It means the idea of rule and dominion, and that word only appears one other time in all the Old Testament, and it's in the very next verse. Government, government. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Wow, I guess if he bears it, You don't have to. You don't have to worry about keeping this world together. He takes care of that. And just like in the ancient world and even in our modern world with soldiers, they wear their stripes, they wear their impressive labels on their shoulders. This one bears the weight of the kingdom of God on his shoulders. Wow. And his name. And you know in the ancient world your name stood for your person, your character, your authority. His name shall be called... Here it is, Wonderful Counselor. Actually, it could better be translated probably a wonder of a counselor. And then it says, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince. The Hebrew word is Sar. It means governor or captain. Prince of Shalom, peace. This is the first time the word peace appears in the book of Isaiah. And it will appear about 25 more times as the book unfolds. And the increase of his government, and by the way, it is increasing, in case you don't know, not always in North America, but it's increasing. In the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. That phrase, no end, means no borders. No borders. And he will sit on the throne of David. David, 
That was 300 years previous to this. And the son of David would be 700 years after this. The throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. And it means a sense of real right and wrong. That wrong will be eradicated and right will be vindicated. And then righteousness, sadiq, which is a very close term to holiness. From this time forth and forevermore. Now I need to tell you the Hebrew word forevermore, olam, sometimes means just a long time. <laughs> like when you say, I haven't been to Walmart forever. Oh yes, you have. You were there yesterday. You know, but it, it just means a long time. But sometimes it means like we use it, time unending. What do you think it means here? I'd say time unending. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. How's that government sound to you? Does that polity sound like something you'd welcome into your heart and into your life? Do you long for a polity that doesn't get log jammed? Do you long for a polity that doesn't, uh, you know, wonder if it's going to have enough money to finish the week? Do you long for a polity somehow that won't end in a filibuster? We have such a polity. And it really is in this character of this child king. Now, the other text that we have to look at, of course, is over here in Luke chapter 1, where uh, the angel Gabriel, and we were talking on the way to church this morning, of how many billions of angels there are. And one of them is named here in Luke 1. His name is Gabriel. And he comes to a teenager in Nazareth of Galilee. And we read that he comes into her presence there and says, Hail thou favored one. I bet that got her attention. And uh, anyway, then he begins to tell her, You're going to have a child. You will bear a son. His name will be Jesus. And then these words. And he will be great. Mega. And he will be called the son of the most high. A little later beyond our text, it will say, Son of God. And the Lord God will give to him, here it is, the throne of his father, David. I thought his father's name was Joseph. No, it's David. And that's not even his father's name. His real father's name is Abba. Father. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no telos. There will be no end. How does that kingdom sound to you? I think if we look at this passage from Isaiah and just say, if, it, if the kingdom, if the polity rests on his character, what's that character like? Well, it's easy to just walk down through these four things. The first is he will be a wonderful counselor, or as I mentioned, a wonder of a counselor. Because this word wonder actually means distinguished. It means exceptional. He's a really good one. Have you ever been to a bad one? Or somebody giving you bad counsel? Uh, the word counsel here actually can be used in positive and negative ways in the Bible. In fact, in Job 16, verse 3, Job says all of his friends, if that's what you want to call them, were miserable counselors. You ever had a few of those? It's a different Hebrew word, but that's what it means, counselor. In 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 8, uh, we read, or chapter 12, verse 8 rather, we read about a guy named Rehoboam who was a son of Solomon. And instead of listening to the wizened counselors of much more maturity, he gave in to the younger guys. And it was a disastrous decision. On the other hand, sometimes there's good counsel. A guy named Jethro, who went on to star in the Beverly Hillbillies. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, <laughs> Jethro was Moses' father-in-law. And he witnessed Moses working himself to the bone. And he said in Exodus 18... Moses, you're going to kill yourself. You need to delegate this to other counselors. It can be used in a good sense. I don't know about you. Have you ever received bum counsel? Have you ever gotten good counsel? I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is a counselor of no one else proportion. I have been in counseling in my life of 70 years five times. I've gone to seek counsel. I went once just my own myself up to see John Walker at Blessing Ranch in Colorado. And I said, hit me with your best shot. And for the next day and a half, he beat the tar out of me. And he gave his counsel. And it was all good counsel. And as much as I respect John Walker, it wasn't anything like this one. Because he's a wonder of a counselor. You just kind of go into the New Testament narratives and you realize what this is like and what it looks like. 
Do you remember in John's gospel during the festival section of those middle chapters? And this text is spurious. I know it is. When we covered the gospel of John early in the year, we didn't even touch on this because it's hard to even know if this was really what John wrote. But it seems to be a rather true story. Jesus in the temple, in the festival section of the book, he's uh, teaching, but the teachers of the law bring a woman caught in the act of adultery. And every woman, woman in this auditorium now wants to say, where's the guy? And you'd be right. You'd be right. But the woman is brought, and Jesus is doodling in the sand. And they say, we caught her in the act. You know, it's a trap. And the law says we're supposed to stone her. What do you say? See, you can see the trap. And Jesus, just finally after doodling in the sand, stands up and says, he was without sin. Let him throw the first stone. And then in an interesting phrase that I'm not sure I got the psychology in me to understand, it says that they all walked away from the oldest to the youngest. I don't know enough psychology to understand what that means. But they left. Jesus is returning to his sand and finally stands up. And when he's with the woman just alone, he says, where are they? Does no one condemn you? And this broken woman probably looked around and said, no, no one. And Jesus said words that I would like to extrapolate and use to you today. Here's what he said. Neither do I condemn you. Do you need to hear that today? Jesus doesn't want to condemn you. It says in John 3, 17, right after the golden verse of the Bible, doesn't it? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe somebody here today needs to hear, I don't condemn you. Boy, you get a counselor like that. Wouldn't you want to respond positively? Now, of course, the text does go on, doesn't it? And he says to her, now go and sin no more. See, you can come to Jesus as you are, but he never leaves you there. He always takes you where he wants you to go. That's a real wonder of a counselor, where he not only cleanses you and doesn't condemn you, but sets you on a new path. So he's a wonder of a counselor. That's part of his polity. What else is part of his polity? Well, according to this text, he's a mighty God. He's a mighty God. This phrase actually means a great one over others. David himself, and David, as you notice, features prominently in these two passages today. David himself uses this phrase when he learns that the guy who is his enemy, but he was the Lord's anointed, died along with his son Jonathan. And he said, in words that drip with emotion, when he learned of their deaths, Oh, how the mighty have fallen! Same word, mighty. Well, if he's mighty, don't think of him as a tender counselor that can't be mighty. You don't want to trifle with him. You don't want to mess with him. He can play kickball with this planet if he wants to. So don't do that. When we were in our study of the Gospel of John earlier in the year, you may remember that one of my favorite passages was in the 18th chapter when, uh, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and they come to arrest him. And the religious leaders come out with their clubs and staves and swords. And Judas leading the pack of both the Roman soldiers and Jewish temple police and religious leaders. They come into that dark garden a third of the way up there on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus, now having prayed, is all ready to go. He's got it together. He's no longer a mess. As he said, let this cup pass from me. Now he's ready. He's cool. He's calm. He's collected and says, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, I love this. Jesus said two words in Greek. Ego ami, which is translated, I am. I know your English Bible says I am he, but that's not what it says. He said, I am. And the text says those soldiers fell to the ground. That's all it takes. 
All it takes is for the mighty God to show up and give his identity and everybody falls. Oh, I've read commentaries where they said, well, the first guy just kind of fell back. It was like a domino effect. Please. I think something more is going on there because this is a mighty God. I read in the most recent issue of the Christian Standard Magazine an article by Tyler McKenzie. I don't know Tyler, but I like his writing. I'm enjoying what he writes. He preaches in in, uh, Louisville, Kentucky area. And uh, Tyler wrote an article uh, recently for the Christmas, uh, November, December issue. On uh, He called it just, Tis the Season for Justice. And he said that in our life, three countries have banned the use of Mary's Magnificat. You're kidding me. A teenager from Nazareth gives a little saying and you're going to ban that by government law? Yep. True. You remember when after this text that we just read from Luke 1 today, Mary goes down to Elizabeth in, the southern, in Judea and Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb. How is it that the mother of my Lord would come to me? And then Mary just breaks out into song. We call it the Magnificat in Latin. My soul doth magnify the Lord, she said. And three countries banned that speech from being used. Previous to British rule ending in India, they banned Mary's Magnificat. In the 1980s, uh, Guatemala banned reading Mary's Magnificat. From 1976 to 1983, Argentina banned reading Mary's Magnificat. Why on earth would you ban a speech from a little teenager? Have you read it? Because it starts, my soul doth magnify the Lord, but by the time it ends, it's a political hot potato. She says this mighty God is going to take the mighty ones and he's going to put them down here and he's going to take the humble and he's going to put them up here. And in certain countries, that speech was banned because it sounded so politically much of an upheaval. So is he mighty God? Yeah, he's mighty God. Is he a wonder of a counselor? Yes, he's a wonder of a counselor. And then it says, an everlasting father. If this relates to Jesus, how does that work? (laughs) This will cause your Trinitarian views and meters to go berserk. How can the father and the son be the same person? But that's one of the mysteries of the Trinity. And I suppose it also has to do something with time because to God, all things live. Everything's present tense with him. And so it can be used that way. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has this vision of the throne room of God and he sees that the Ancient of Days has sat on the throne and all these qualities attributed to the Ancient of Days and you keep reading and you realize the Son of Man shows up in this throne room. And guess who has the identical qualities as the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne? This one called Son of Man. Because he is also everlasting Father. A fatherly king. I'll be honest with you, the fatherhood of God is not spoken very much about in the Old Testament. It will be till Jesus comes when he gives the idea of the fatherhood of God a whole new dimension for us to understand. But he is a tender Father. I think of Isaiah 42, quoted in Matthew 12. A bruised reed he will not break. That sounds like a dad who came to rescue his kid that had a fender bender. A smoldering wick he will not blow out. No, because this Messiah, this child king, is a tender father. And for a life that's just about to go out, he'll cup his hands around that wick and he'll fan it into flame. Sometimes you're that way, sometimes I'm that way. And when we're broken, he takes out his spiritual duct tape and he winds it around, it, or winds it around us so that we won't break. Because he is an everlasting father, tender father. Uh, read, as you have read, about uh, Mr. Shackleton, who was an explorer in the South Pole, Sir Ernest Shackleton. And you know of his journeys there on the South Pole. He left a number of men at Elephant Island one time, and he said, I'll be back. Sounds like something a dad or a boss would say. But he left them there, and the ice came back together, and he couldn't get to them. And almost like a miracle happened that suddenly the ice broke, 
And there was a path through the sea, and he got his ship in. The boys were all ready, had their sleeping bags rolled up. They jumped on the craft, the shift, and they got out of there. And right after the ship left the sea, the ice came back together. And Sir Ernest Shackleton said to his men, Wow, you, you must have been ready for me to come. You must have, because you jumped right on. We had just a very narrow window of time. And they said, Oh, we just trusted you. You're the boss. We knew you'd be back. We knew you'd come to get us. We were, anytime there was a break in the weather and a break in the sea, we rolled up our sleeping bags to get ready. That's a tender father that you know he's going to keep his word and he's going to come looking for you. And this last one is probably the most endearing of all. He's the Tsar. He's the captain. He's the governor of peace, prince of peace. That's his polity. As I mentioned to you earlier, Shalom is mentioned for the first time here in Isaiah 9 and then it's mentioned 20 some times later in the book. And who among us today would not say that we want more of that? Is there anybody here who would say, not me, I got all the peace I can handle. I, don't, I want out. I didn't. No, both personally, existentially, and corporately, we all desire this. Uh, I'm thinking right now of that man in Mark 5 who had no peace in his life. He lived in the cemetery. They bound him with chains. He had supernatural strength. He was deranged and demon-possessed. He was a cutter. And the disciples and Jesus had just gotten off the boat from a storm, hello. And then they encountered the jaws of hell from a cemetery. Guy coming naked, bleeding, running at them. And Jesus casts out the demon and restores peace to this man. And the next thing we read about is he is clothed and in his right mind. And he wasn't a very bad evangelist either. If you ask him, did the polity of the Son of God change your life? Oh, I had no peace when I lived in the cemetery. But now, I'm an evangelist for him. And what about it corporately? All I'd have to say this morning is Gaza or Ukraine or a thousand other places that just have no peace, no corporate peace. One of my other mothers, one of my alma maters is Denver Seminary. And every year at Denver Seminary at this time, they send you out in the mail a little Advent book that you can read the devotionals from the professors at Denver Seminary. And they have one for each day. So I read day one, day two. Tonight when we get home and have our little private, we'll read day three. And yes, I confess, I cheated. I looked ahead. (laughs) But I did because one of my teachers, Dr. Craig Blomberg, wrote December 24th. So I leaped forward. And I really never thought much about Dr. Blomberg's name before. I just knew he's a great New Testament professor and I profited so much from his teaching. Uh, But uh, he told in the beginning of his little Advent piece about the 2005 movie, which I had heard the story a thousand times, never really seen the movie, based all on the true story of what happened in World War I, the world war to end all wars, right? Okay. And uh, what happened on Christmas Eve in 1914 when the Scots and the French and the Germans were at war. It made a movie out of it called Joy Noel, which is French for Merry Christmas. And this would be a longer clip than I would normally use. But I watched the clip after he referred to it, and then I watched as much of the movie as I could. It is PG-13. I'm always a little bit leery of recommending. But maybe this will help you with Prince of Peace. War has been declared. For this war is indeed a crusade to save the freedom of the world. I abandoned them 
like a coward. And I let him die. Now we must pray for him. And for all the other casualties. Aber seien Sie wachsam. Denen ist alles zuzutrauen, selbst an Heiligabend. We were talking about a, a ceasefire. I don't think anyone would criticize us for laying down our rifles on Christmas Eve. This is my wife. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. Very nice. It's time for you to go back. I hope you both make it through the war. The truce is over. Any minute now, the Germans will start shooting at you. What are you waiting for? Shoot him! Shame on you, Gordon. Shame on you. Without an enemy, there can be no war. I'll tell you why I went ahead and looked at that. It was because of the end of the article by Dr. Blomberg. When at the very end, he told about his maternal grandfather who fought in World War I. And then it hit me. Blomberg, you idiot. He fought for the Germans. And on July the 4th, Kind of an interesting date. 1918, I think I said 16 the first hour. That boy, that maternal grandfather, Dr. Blom, turned 18. So if the war went from 1914 to 1918, guess what age he was when he enrolled as a soldier? So it's 1918, it's July 4th, and Blomberg's maternal grandfather was fighting. In 1923, he immigrated to the United States. And he became an American citizen. And Dr. Blomberg says he became a very loyal patriot to the United States of America. Only the child king can have that kind of polity. So this morning, for an invitation song, we're going to sing a song that's a Christmas song. It's probably not really just a invitation song per se but it was uh, done by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and uh, you may know the story behind it it was December 25th 1863 anybody remember what was going on in this country in 1863 and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a song I heard the bells on Christmas Day the old familiar carols play but one of the verses and we will sing it, says, And in despair I bowed my head. Kind of how I'm feeling this Christmas. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. It wasn't just corporately with the Civil War he said that. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's wife had died in a house fire when he was 57 years old. They had six children, the oldest of which was paralyzed. He was writing out of great despair. But he had the guts to write this. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. I don't know who here this morning needs the wonder of a counselor, but who's in your ear? Who are you listening to? Who's giving you counsel? You're going to get it from the TV? What about mighty God? Maybe there's somebody here this morning that's got, needs mighty God, needs, needs a God to deliver them from addictions and habits and things that are hurting you. 
Maybe there's somebody here this morning that just needs the tenderness of a dad, just the tenderness of a father that will say, I'll come back and get you. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'll come back and get you. Maybe you need this morning a personal peace, private peace, internal peace, corporate peace, national peace, familial peace in your family. If there's anybody here that needs to make a public decision for Christ today about him and his church, listen to me. (laughs) It's the polity of the child king. And it rests in who he is, his character. You can experience those things today if you desire to. Let's stand on our feet and let's sing together. And you respond as the Lord leads you today. Let's sing.